This video is brought to you by The Daily Peanut. Hey, what up, Wisecrack? Chris here, and today we're talking about The Legend of Korra. Now, there are some pretty mixed opinions on this show. It tried hard to live up to the beloved Avatar series and was often successful. It had excellent characters, inventive action sequences, and a truly moving finale. But most would probably agree that it never quite matched its predecessor, and the reason lies in its struggle to do what avatars must do, find balance. We'll explain how in this wisecrack edition on The Legend of Korra, what went wrong. Spoilers ahead for Avatar, The Last Airbender, and The Legend of Korra. I'm the Avatar, you gotta deal with it. And before we continue, I wanna give a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, The Daily Peanut. The Daily Peanut is a fast and fun way to learn about what is going on around the world by delivering you the hottest news in equal parts humor and substance. Let's face it, so many of us turn to Twitter to read the headlines, but don't really take the time to learn more about what's going on. And on top of that, half of the headlines feel like something that was written to gain attention, but isn't exactly news. With the Daily Peanut, you'll have everything delivered to your inbox each morning so you can stay informed about news that matters. Join over 250,000 readers and get educated and entertained. Sign up for free using the link in the description. Now, back to the show. Rather than starting in the original Avatar's era, Korra shoots us 70 years into an almost unrecognizable future. We pick up in Republic City, a thriving multicultural metropolis founded by Aang. Most who practice the ancient art of bending have now fully integrated their talents into this industrialized world. A talented few compete in the glitzy world of pro-bending, while others just use their skills for crime. It's a much more complicated world than the one Aang knew. And as Korra quickly finds, the Avatar can no longer just come crashing in to save the day. On its face, this seems pretty interesting. It complicates the world of the original show, making space to also complicate its central theme. And what was that theme? Balance. As you may remember, when the Fire Lord's aggression knocked things out of whack, Aang's mission was to tilt the scales back towards equanimity between the kingdoms. But unlike that relatively dualistic conflict, Korra's world is full of competing interests, fraught relationships, festering grievances, and faulty political mechanisms, all of which she will need to take into account to perform her role as Avatar. Your job isn't to fix the daily problems of every person in Republic City. Your responsibility is to bring balance to the entire world. And that means no matter what you do, some people are not going to be happy about it. Each season gives us the struggle of finding balance in a complex world, whether it's dealing with spirit worlds or warring nations. But one of the main problems with the series is that it then struggles to fully reckon with the conflict that it's created, which is best visualized through the show's most compelling villains. See, each antagonist on the show reinforces the moral ambiguity of Korra's world. This starts with its first big villain, Amon. The Avatar has failed humanity. That is why the spirits have chosen me to usher in a new era of balance. Heading up a group called the Equalists, Amon is a radical outsider who preaches against the unequal division of power in Republic City. He resents the fact that benders are elevated above the rest by sheer birthright, relegating everyone else to second-class citizenship. In a sense, he's chafing against society's imbalanced hierarchy. Unsurprisingly, his message resonates with the city's downtrodden, even as he starts taking increasingly extreme actions, like attacking a sporting event and forcibly removing a starbender's powers. Amon doesn't only challenge Korra physically in battle, his very philosophy threatens her identity. Having inherited both her title and her power, she represents the hierarchy he seeks to overthrow. While Avatar's ancient, operatic setting was comfortable celebrating predestined leaders and heroes, Korra and Amon's battle questions how power should be distributed in a more modern world. The conflict asks, how does a society achieve balance between benders and non-benders? Until it doesn't. Amon is eventually revealed to be a waterbender in disguise, driven by a personal grudge against his abusive, bloodbending father. And that message he preached? It was more about stirring up a ruckus than agitating for equality. Because Amon turns out to be a fraud, his original message evaporates, and Korra is never forced to really confront her place in the hierarchy. With season two, we move on to a new villain, Unalak, who strikes even closer to home. See, Unalak is both Korra's uncle and the chief of the Northern Water Tribe, while her father, Tonrock, leads the Southern. The two brothers are divided on matters of spirituality. Tonrock is happy to turn their religious traditions into commercial events so that their people can prosper, while Unalak sees this as a sacrilegious betrayal of their heritage. The question is, can there be a happy balance between their conflicting views? This puts Korra in the middle of a struggle that goes far beyond a family feud. 
As the Avatar, she represents an ancient spiritual tradition and must figure out what role it plays in the modern world. The war between Unalak and Tonrock is really about the place we allow the past to occupy in our present. That is to say, how do we balance the values of the past with the realities of the present? During the Hundred Year War, the South was thrown out of balance and the lights disappeared. When the war ended, the North helped to rebuild you physically as a nation. But we have not rebuilt you spiritually. Until again, it's not. Unalak, it's eventually revealed, is a capital B bad dude who wants to unleash the spirit world so he can become a dark avatar. All that stuff about modern commercialism, spoiling tradition, again, it basically recedes into the background. This time around, Korra does actually find herself wondering about the bad guy's motivations after the dust has settled. She even finishes the season by reopening the connection to the spirit world, just as Unalak had originally intended. What if Unalak was right when he said the Avatar shouldn't be a bridge between the two worlds? What if Avatar Wan made a mistake when he closed the portals? What if humans and spirits weren't meant to live apart? While this seems like it should be a meaningful conclusion to their conflict, it doesn't really track because Unalak never made much of a case for why reuniting the worlds would be a good thing, or even what it would really mean, and was ultimately way more focused on becoming a super powerful dark avatar. So it really just seems more like Korra is letting a gut feeling decide the fate of their world. What do you think I should do? I think you should trust your instincts. There is nothing else I can teach you. You are the Avatar. Let's skip ahead to season four for reasons that will very soon become clear. Here, Korra faces off against the great uniter herself, Kavira. A decorated military commander and world-class metal bender, Kavira is enraged at the Earth Kingdom's fall from power. Eager to revive the kingdom's glory days, she begins forcibly reuniting all its former territories. Like many real-world populists, Kuvira weaponizes a vision of her nation's glorious past, gaining the support of everyone who is angry at their homeland's downfall, and eager for someone else to blame. She presents herself as an ally of the common man, fighting back against powerful elites like Korra and Prince Wu, even as her own actions become increasingly oppressive. I learned that the idea of a royal family passing a title from one generation to the next was archaic, and that technology and innovation should be what drives a nation forward. It's a neat parable about how nationalist sentiments are stoked under the guise of reclaiming what is rightfully yours. And once again, it sees Korra forced to interrogate her own role in everything as Kavira leads a crusade against the inherited power she, as an avatar, represents. Kavira poses important questions. How should Korra reconcile, that is, balance, the competing political interests in her world when things get messy? Or does she have a duty to remain impartial and let the Earth Kingdom resolve its own leadership dispute? But as with our previous two villains, this conflict quickly recedes to the background. Kuvira becomes consumed by power, unleashing a super weapon that threatens to destroy the whole of Republic City. Her populist message about avenging past wrongs and empowering the oppressed is quickly trampled underneath a giant mechanical foot. Once again, Korra isn't fully forced to balance the implications of her inherited powers and elevated status, nor does she ultimately need to find balance in the conflicting worldviews around her. She just lays the smack down on another supervillain and takes a bow. All three of these big bads are set up to make for compelling villains with motivations that are understandable and even sympathetic. And better yet, they offer a perfect route for the show to continue one of the primary thematic through lines of Avatar, the concept of balance. Each conflict in Avatar was really about this quest for harmony. Each character was trying to reckon with the parts of themselves that were at war. Like Zuko's shame and pride, Katara's desire for revenge, and Aang's fear of disappointing his friends. The show's idea of balance loosely blends Eastern philosophical traditions and modern day psychotherapy. When we see Aang working to unblock his chakras with Guru Patik, we're basically watching him on the couch undergoing therapy, delving into his most painful memories and greatest fears so that he can overcome them. The air nomad's love for you has not left this world. It is still inside of your heart and is reborn in the form of new love. Balance is the through line of Avatar, but in the sequel series, the attempt to perpetuate this theme starts to flounder as each antagonist eventually becomes straight up evil. Their passions, yes, become unbalanced, but not in any interesting way. Rather, they seemingly abandon the concerns which impelled them to power in the first place. This reduces Korra's task to beating them down rather than confronting the issues they embody. And when these issues, equality, heritage, commercialism, and democracy are so interesting to begin with, the choice feels kind of like a cop-out. 
When Korra asks how her antagonists strayed so far from their righteous intentions, she's given a simple answer by her surly, swamp-dwelling mentor, Toph. What did Amon want? Equality for all. Unalak? He brought back the spirits. And Zaheer believed in freedom. I guess. The problem was those guys were totally out of balance and they took their ideologies too far. And while it makes for a neat line, this explanation isn't really satisfying. Amon and Unalak didn't so much take their ideology too far as they did abandon it altogether. Ultimately, they pursue selfish goals involving revenge and evil spirit powers. Meanwhile, Kavira simply becomes the very sort of tyrant that she was supposed to be fighting. It devolves from a complicated question of balance to a simplistic story of good versus evil. This leaves the actual issues they brought up and Korra's role in them totally unresolved at the end of each season. Important questions go unanswered, like, what does it mean to live in a world where power is doled out so arbitrarily and unequally? And how much right does she have to use her power to intervene in conflicts that have nothing to do with her? Generally, The Legend of Korra uses its multifaceted modern world to set up all these moral dilemmas and then sort of mumbles its way through the answers, eschewing genuine critique and leading into Korra's presumed perfect heroism. And while it's certainly fun to watch, it also falls a little flat. Even when Korra empathizes with Kuvira. I may not have been an orphan, but believe me, I understand what it feels like to be afraid. Or reconsiders Unalak's argument, it doesn't actually change the way she ultimately vanquishes them. That is to say, the knowledge she gains never helps her defeat the bad guys. That's not to say that the show is disappointing in its treatment of antagonists across the board. It does manage to follow through on one occasion, creating its most compelling villain in season three with Zaheer. He provides Korra with a dark reflection, interrogating her identity as the Avatar and the very concept of balance that it's founded upon. He does so not by disagreeing with her, but by taking this idea to its nihilistic extreme. I want what you want, to restore balance to this world. I don't think our ideas of balance are the same. Like his fellow bad guys, Zaheer has an ax to grind with the current world order. He sought to overthrow the rulers of the world so that everyone could be free. We catch up with Zaheer years after his failed attempt to kidnap the Avatar. After years spent meditating in prison, he emerges with some newfound airbending abilities and a zen-like philosophy. Zaheer's character isn't merely political. He's also motivated by a personal belief that true freedom lies in detachment from the material world. He aims to achieve this enlightenment and wants everyone else to as well, specifically by freeing themselves from all social bonds. This ethos, especially delivered in Zaheer's monk-like monotone, rings eerily close to the teachings Aang himself received. As both an airbender and the Avatar, Aang was less tethered to the material world than those around him. This perspective kept him neutral, making it easier for him to keep the peace. But in the moment where Zaheer achieves his own form of spiritual detachment, we see clearly how different his philosophy is from the Avatar's. After watching the woman he loves get brutally murdered, Zaheer loses his last emotional tie to the world around him. Please. Now, completely untethered, he unlocks a talent previously consigned to airbending legends and floats freely into the air. Here, we learn that the true source of Zaheer's power is how little he cares. To him, balance means a total lack of concern for everyone else. Empty and become wind. No, stop! Rather than allowing him to act as a force for impartial justice, Zaheer's complete detachment renders him an instrument of chaos. He wants to tear down governments, not to build more compassionate structures in their place, but to create a state of total disorder. His idea of balance is based upon a total detachment from all forms of connection, envisioning a world in which everyone is free to do whatever they like, while calling this balance. This is the complete opposite of the Avatar. While avatars might pride themselves on extending sympathy to all and learning to see both sides of an argument, they will ultimately still feel morally compelled to pick a side. When the Fire Nation began its rampage, Aang could have just remained impartial, claiming neutrality in the name of unity. But he didn't, because one side was clearly wrong and the other needed his protection. For all his training, Aang remained grounded by his compassion for and connection with other human beings. And by following his example, Korra is eventually able to defeat Zaheer. Even in his transcendent state, the villain is no match for the combined might of Korra and all her loved ones. Here, being connected to others is a strength. 
In their final throwdown, Korra and Co. directly challenge the idea that rising above earthly conflict is necessarily the most high-minded or fair way to go. So here's rhetoric is often compelling, but without a humanistic foundation, it's just an excuse to abandon the duty we have to each other. It's a highly intellectualized selfishness dressed up as freedom. Especially in an era as complicated as Korra's, keeping the world in balance means remaining tethered to it by compassion for others. In a blistering season three finale, the show actually fulfills its original promise, embracing the complexity of its more modern setting and forcing Korra to decide what being the Avatar means now. Just as Republic City sits in the shadow of Avatar Aang, the legend of Korra had a massive legacy to live up to thanks to the beloved bald child who came before. And it's ambitious about it too, moving the Avatar's peacemaking mission to a far more fraught and fractured era. That said, it often struggles to fully reckon with all that this entails. Still, in its best moments, Korra is driven by the same philosophy of balance which drove Avatar, a creed which always values compassionate action over useless impartiality. So what do you guys think? Was Korra fit to carry on Aang's legacy? Or did all that talk of harmonic convergence have you tearing your hair out? Let us know in the comments. Hit that subscribe button like you're a keyboard bender, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Peace.